your Bibles to John chapter 10. We're going to be in verses 15 to 21 this morning. We're going to talk about the good shepherd and how he loves and obeys his father. The first 14 verses of John 10, during that time, Jesus established his credentials as the shepherd of the sheep. He contrasted himself with the thieves and the robbers in verses 2, 5, 8, and 10, and then contrasted himself with the hireling in verses 12 to 13. So you saw a difference between Jesus and some of the people that were in this story, or in this, this set of verses. And then he used verses 1 to 3 and 7 to 9 to set up the picture of a door, himself as the door of the sheep showing his protection and his provision for the sheep. And he used the illustration of the shepherd to show that he loves and cares for his sheep in verses 11 to 14. In all of that, he was speaking of the relationship that he has with the sheep and the difference between that relationship and the destructive relationship of others, but showing how important that relationship between sheep and shepherd is. That's what you see in those first 14 verses. It's essentially a, ho a horizontal relationship, shepherd and sheep. But starting in verse 15, Jesus brings his father into the discussion. That's not the first time Jesus has talked about his father. His, he, his relationship with his father has, been, has permeated the last several chapters of the book of John, and it's going to move forward from here. In fact, it's going to get him into a lot of trouble with the, uh, the religious leaders in just a few verses down in chapter 10. But beginning in verse in, in the verse 1 of chapter 10, he's been talking about this horizontal relationship. You get to verse 15, and now it's this vertical relationship between Jesus as he walks on earth and his Father in heaven. Several aspects of that vertical relationship are going to come into view in these verses. And we're going to trace that this morning and see how Jesus obeyed his Father's direction with the power that only God can have. So I want to read verses 15 to 21, John chapter 10. If you have your Bibles open to that, uh, I'd like you to follow along with me as I read. John chapter 10, beginning with verse 15. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Therefore there was a division among, again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Verse 15 begins with a statement of relationship. A statement of father-son relationship. An exclusive relationship, as we're going to see here. Jesus said, as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. Now Jesus had just finished saying, I know the sheep and am known by my own. He had just finished saying that. And in point of fact, all the uses of the word know are the same word in Greek. It's all the same word, different tenses, but the same word. He was expressing a relationship with the sheep of his flock in these earlier verses, and, and it was a relationship that was mutual, that was reciprocal. I know them, they know me. This is a similar statement on a different level in verse 15. The Father knows me, and I know the Father. The relationship also flows in both directions. Now, you might think, because all the, the word know is all the same here, that Jesus is talking about relationships on the same level or with the same kind of, of uh, um, exclusivity, if you will, or inclusivity. But that's not the case. 
what you're going to see if you read through the book of John, what you're going to see in G from Jesus on a regular basis is, I have a relationship with my father that's different than any other relationship that I have. And I have a relationship with my father that none of you could possibly have. My relationship with my father is unique. It is exclusive. Because I trusted Christ as my savior, I am a son of God. But I am not the son of God. I have been begotten again, born again, but I am not the only begotten. So it wasn't like his relationship with the, sh with the sheep or the negative relationship with thieves and robbers or the hireling. It was unique, and I'd like to suggest also, based upon this verse, that it was foundational. The relationship of the shepherd to the sheep was based on the relationship with the father, between the father and the son. So if there was no relationship between father and son, there would be no relationship between shepherd and sheep. It connected to the sacrifice that he would make, this relationship with the father. It connected to the flock that he would gather to himself. It was based on mutual love, as we'll see in a moment. It was based on obedience, the son obeying the father, which we'll also see in a moment. And it was based on a plan to save the sheep. There is a connection between Jesus and his father that predates and supersedes every other relationship known to man. Now the second half of the verse says that I lay down my life for the sheep. And it's sort of a restatement of the sacrifice idea from verse 11. If you remember, he said up in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So a little bit different wording. But that slightly different wording signals a different intent and an important clarification on Jesus' part. He said, I, so he is identifying himself again as the good shepherd, I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, we'll, again, we'll get to this in a little bit more detail in verse 18. I'm making a lot of promises here. I better get to this stuff at the end of the message. But that phrase, lay down my life, carries meaning beyond what we might say or think. I want you to notice also that the sacrifice is connected to this mutual relationship between father and son. I mentioned that briefly just a second ago. But there is a causal relationship because the father knows the son and because the son knows the father. Jesus was willing to do this sacrifice. There's a relational connection to the life sacrifice that Jesus was going to make. That sacrifice was dependent upon the intimate relationship between father and son. That brings us to verse 16. In verse 16, I'm going to read it again. Verse 16 is an important verse. A lot of ink has been spilled trying to explain verse 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. They will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Let me give you a few of the thoughts that have sprung up over the years as to what this passage means. Some believe it's a reference to Jews. The other sheep is a reference to Jews living outside of Palestine. So that Jesus is having this relationship with Jews who are living in Palestine, where he has his ministry, but there are other Jews living outside of Palestine, and those are the other sheep that are talk, spoken of here. So in that view, all of the sheep are Jewish. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that this is a reference to non-anointed Christians. A different class of believers than the 144,000 in Revelation 7 and 14 who they say are Jehovah's Witnesses. This is a different class of people, the other sheep. Mormons believe that this is a reference to the part of Jesus' flock that they say resided in North America shortly after Jesus walked on the earth, tribes that no longer exist. They say Jesus made an appearance here and drew ancient North Americans into his flock. And those ancient North Americans 
are the forebears, in a sense, of those who are Mormons today. Now, let me say, none of these ideas make sense of the text or the context. So none of what I just mentioned is what Jesus is talking about in verse 16. The phrase, other sheep I have, is in the present tense, meaning that Jesus was referring to a class of people already in existence, but not yet in the sheepfold. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. That is, they were not of the believers from the house of Israel. All of the people in the sheepfold that Jesus is talking about in the first verses of chapter 10 are Jewish people who have come to know Christ. That's who they are. So when they're not of this fold, or it says they're not of this fold, it's, it's referring to somebody other than Jewish believers. Well, who would that be? It would be Gentile believers. He would be bringing Gentiles into this fold. So this is a prediction on Jesus' part that the fold that he is going to be the shepherd over is going to include Jews and Gentiles, other sheep that I have. You say, well, how can you prove that? Well, this is consistent with the natural and grafted branches that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 11, verses 17 to 25. The natural branches being the Jewish people, the grafted branches being Gentile people who have trusted Christ. Jewish people have trusted Christ, Gentile people have trusted Christ. So that the idea that there's going to be Gentile people coming into the church, this, that, that thought that Jesus is mentioning here is reiterated again in Romans chapter 11. And the narrative of Acts, especially once you get to chapter 10 and following, shows you the idea that it's going to be Gentile believers coming into the church at a time when the Jewish people all of a sudden come face to face with the idea that the church is going to include Gentiles. Up until then they're saying, Gentiles? Not a chance. It's only Jewish people. But then all of a sudden God brings Gentiles in. You think of the story of Cornelius and then the, the missionary journeys of Paul. And you see that that's the case. So this is, consist this is completely consistent um, with the rest of the New Testament narrative. These other sheep weren't in the fold yet, but the day was coming when he would bring them in. And they would respond to the voice of the shepherd just as the Jewish sheep had responded to the voice of the shepherd. The history of the early church begins with Israel. By the time you get to the end of the book of Acts, and then all of the epistles that go along with that, you have a flock that is composed of both Jews and Gentiles. And then he says this at the end of verse 16. There will be one flock and one shepherd. Keep your finger here and go to Galatians chapter 3. In this letter to the churches of Galatia, Paul's working to rid the churches of the notion that they have to turn back to Judaism in order to become part of Christ's church. That's what's infiltrating the churches in Galatia. If you want to be part of Christ's church, you have to go back and, and worship as the Jews worship. And you have to do all the laws the way the Jews did the laws. He wanted them to see that Christ was building something new. And that something was the body of Christ composed of both Jews and Gentiles. I'm reading starting with verse 26. Galatians chapter 3. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you, of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heir's According to the promise, there are not two flocks or three flocks. There is not an American flock and a European flock and an African flock and an Asian flock. There's not a Jewish flock and a Gentile flock. There's not an elite flock 
and a non-anointed flock. There is one flock under one shepherd. We are members of the body of Christ. If we know Jesus Christ as Savior, put our faith in Jesus Christ. We're members of the body of Christ. We're members of the church of Jesus Christ, the flock of God, and Jesus Christ is our shepherd. If you have trusted Jesus as your Savior, it doesn't make any difference where you were born. I was born in Detroit, Michigan, United States. My brother over here was born in Liberia. Pretty much opposite sides of the world. And we are brothers in Christ. And we are part of the family of God. And we are part of the body of Christ. I don't, I don't have to be... I don't have to be thinking of Christianity as a white man's religion. I don't have to be thinking of Christianity as a European-American religion. I shouldn't be thinking of Christianity that way. I shouldn't be thinking of it as just another religious system. I'm part of the family of God. And I have brothers and sisters in Christ all over this globe. And they look different and they speak. Some of them I couldn't understand if they asked me for a drink of water. But we are part of the same family. And that's what Jesus is saying here. I have another, I have other sheep that I have to bring into this one flock over which I am the one shepherd. I get tired of people trying to separate us. We are not separable. We are part of the same family. Your nationality, your economic status, your physical characteristics, none of that makes any difference. We who have trusted Christ are part of one flock under one shepherd. We are family. All that other stuff fades into insignificance. I love this verse. Because in this verse, there's several verses in John that really strike me. In this verse, I find out that I was in Jesus' mind. You go to chapter 17, and he's praying to his father, and he talks about those who are going to believe as a result of the testimony of, uh, of the apostles. And I find out I'm in Jesus' mind. He's already thinking about me, even before he died. Of course, that doesn't, shouldn't surprise us too much since he's the eternal son of God. But still, it's an exciting verse to read. When we come to verses 17 and 18, we've, we've got a willing death here. An endearing sacrifice. Verse 17 begins with the word, therefore. Indicating that what Jesus was about to say was based on what he had said previously. That's what the word, therefore, always means. Something's coming on the basis of something that's already been said. It's not that the father waited until Jesus died to love him. Therefore, my father loves me. He waited until I was going to die, and then he loved me. No, that's not, that's not what this means. Instead, the love of the father is based upon the relationship between father and son. The consistent, never-failing willingness of the son to obey the father. So therefore means, because I know my father, and he knows me. Because that's the case. Because I willingly lay down my life for the sheep. Because I am carrying out the Father's plan to reconcile the world, including Gentiles, to himself. Because I and my Father are one. One in essence. One in purpose. One in direction. One in love for each other. Because of all of that, therefore my Father loves me. And then he says, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. And I want you to see here the Savior's power. He reiterates his plan to lay down his life for the sheep, but he added an element he hadn't mentioned before. 
he says, that I may take it again. And I would like to suggest that that means in order that I may take it again. So that I, you had to die in order to take it again, to, in order to resurrect. He had to lay his life down in order to take it up again. So there is a causal um, relationship here. The death takes place and then the resurrection takes place. That may seem elementary to us, but if you think about it, you have to have that order. Jesus wasn't going to die and fade away. We talked about the fact that uh, in, in, a, in a real shepherd-sheep relationship, not the illustration Jesus is using, but in a real relationship, if a shepherd goes out to defend the sheep and dies, then all of a sudden the sheep are defenseless. But Jesus is going out to defend the sheep and he's going to die and we're not defenseless because he's going to rise again. His death would not be the end. No matter how hard Satan tried, no matter what precautions the Pharisees took in, tr in order to try to keep him in that hole in the ground. No matter that it had never happened before. Death would not be the end. In order for Jesus to conquer death, he had to die. And then he had to rise from the dead. And that death had to precede the resurrection. So he says what he says on purpose, because I lay down my, my life in order that I may take it up again. It goes on in verse 18 to say, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. And that's the, the nuance that I was referring to earlier. When, when Jesus says, I'm going to lay down my life, he's talking about laying it down of his own accord. I have the power to lay it down. And I have the power to take it again. You know, it might be said that someone who pushes another person out of the path of a speeding car and dies in the process laid his life down for that person. And there's a sense in which that's true. But the one who died did not release his spirit like Jesus did. His life was taken from him by the impact with the car. Jesus did not die because he was crucified. I say that to you again. Jesus did not die because he was crucified. If he had died based upon the crucifixion, it probably would have been after his legs were broken like the two thieves next to him. Or if they had had time after two or three days passed and he hung on the cross and then he would have died. No, Jesus didn't die that way. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Jesus released his spirit. He died because he chose to die. He died because he laid down his life of his own accord. On the third day, he reclaimed his life. Now, others had come back from the dead. Lazarus came back from the dead. The son of the widow of Nain came back from the dead. But someone else had to act on those people. Lazarus didn't come back to, from the dead on his own accord. The son of the widow of Nain was dead and gone until Jesus showed up. Jesus picked his life up again. Nobody else can do that. He needed no one else to give it back to him. You know, from our perspective, that is amazing power. Many of us, not all of us, but many of us have experienced being in the room when someone died. And there is a demarcation Alive, dead, here, gone. And once you cross that line, you're not coming back. You're gone. So for us, it's amazing power to think of someone who crossed the line and of his own power came back. That's just stunning. And yet it's child's play for the Son of God the creator of the universe. No big deal. Because, you know, not only did he bring his own life 
back. He's going to raise all of us. I, I'm coming back someday. I'm not even dead yet, but I'm coming back someday. And when I do, it's not going to be because of how great I am. It's because of, I have a relationship with the creator of the universe who could lay his own life down and pick it up. And he can pick up mine too. And if you know Jesus as your Savior, he'll pick yours up as well. Now at the end of verse 18, there is another statement that we need to touch on at least. And that is, he says, this command I have received from my Father. We sometimes think of, of we, we have a hard time with the Trinity concept. I mean, let's, be, let's face it, it's not an easy concept to deal with. How can these three persons be one God? How can that one God have relational roles? Uh, how does all that work? And yet there is a, a role function within the Trinity. Jesus puts himself voluntarily in a position of obedience to his Father. And so he says here, this command I have received from my father and the implicit statement is and I obey it I do what he told me to do wasn't he equal with the father absolutely he's equal with the father well then why, why is he in this position well we don't we think of command and obedience from the perspective of people who are um, who, who are over each other and, and under each other and, and that is in every respect the case not true here we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a relationship with the person in the Trinity who is equal to every other person in the Trinity. Yet Jesus obeys his Father. He received a command from his Father, and Jesus carried out the command. And that was never in doubt, because I and my Father are one, he says, down, down to verse 30. Well, I, I would always do what my Father tells me to do. We are one. He was ever the obedient son, willing to carry out the Father's will, no matter the cost, because he was entirely wrapped up in the Father's will. Whatever the Father's will was, that's what he was doing. Now that brings us to verse 19, and sort of a commentary from John based upon the response of the people in the crowd, who were mainly the Jewish leaders, at least the ones responding. Remember that when John identifies listeners as the Jews, he's not talking about all of the Jews that are standing there. He's talking about the Jewish leadership. He's talking about the religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. So he's speaking of the national leadership of the Jewish people, not the rank and file. So when he says, therefore, there was a division again among the Jews, he's talking about among the leaders, the elders of the people. and They were divided in their opinion on Jesus. Verse 19 tells us that they were split regarding Jesus. As he spoke, some were wagging their heads side to side. Some were nodding their heads up and down. Kind of like what I see from time to time. The group mentioned in verse 20 slandered Jesus. Here's what they said. He has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? You may have heard the statement, you have to make up your mind about Jesus. He was either a liar, a lunatic, or a lord of all. They chose the first two. They said he's a liar and he's a lunatic. He has a demon. Satan is the father of lies. And he's mad. He's insane. He's a lunatic. They said he was intentionally evil and insane. And at least they were honest enough not to try that he was a good man dodge that we hear all the time today. Oh, he was a good man. Well, how can he be a good man and tell you things that you don't believe are, are true? That's not a good man. Or, he was a good man, but he was completely out of his mind. That's not a good man either. But that's what these guys said. He's, he's not only a liar, but he is also insane. These people despised Jesus, and they were not willing to actually interact with what he had to say. They just brushed him off with a wave of the hand and a gratuitous insult or two. It's pretty easy to throw out a cute quip intended to cut down your opponent sort of in a um, 
the, the what do they call it, the dialogue where you're debate in a debate. My my purpose in a debate is to make you uh, look as bad as possible. That's kind of the way that these guys are approaching this. It's much harder to listen and to digest and to consider and to interact with a person with whom you disagree. You know, that's what Paul was saying to the to the. Uh, or what Luke was actually saying about the Berean church. Think about the Berean church, he said to the people who were reading. These people searched the scriptures to see whether what Paul said was true. They interacted with what he had to say. A lot of their Jewish brethren in other cities simply blew Paul off. These people interacted with what he had to say. But we don't like to do that. Sometimes we just don't want to put out the effort because it takes work to sit and think and listen and, and interact in a manner that's not just brushing a person off. Sometimes we don't like the person and we just want to get in a dig. Sometimes we don't understand and we want to avoid thinking too much about it. I've got other things I want to focus my attention on. And sometimes we're afraid that they might just be right. And I don't want to go there. And that's where these people were. If he's right, Something has to change in me, and I don't want to go there. So let's just call him insane and evil. But verse 21 introduces us to a different group. They listen to the first group. They listen to Jesus. Then they listen to the comments from the first group. And then they said, not so fast. There aren't, these aren't the words of someone who's demon-possessed. We've been around people who are demon-possessed. They don't sound like this. What's more, he doesn't act like somebody who's demon-possessed. When's the last time you saw a demon-possessed person heal somebody who's been born blind? That had never happened. This man opened the eyes of someone who was born blind. Even our own theology says that has to be the Messiah. So your insults don't carry water. Now let me say, I, I think there's a lesson here for us when we interact with unbelievers. Some of them will blow Jesus off with a wave of the hand and an unwarranted insult. It's going to happen. Don't be put off by that. What they're hoping is, and what these guys were hoping is, let's just shut down the discussion. Let's just shut down the argument. Don't be put off by that. Stand your ground. Challenge their arrogance with questions. I think it was really good. If you, if, if you didn't, weren't, weren't part of our, our book club and you didn't read the book Tactics, read the book Tactics, at least the first three or four chapters, because it talks about questions. It talks about asking questions, the importance of asking questions. Don't just let them get away with that. Ask questions challenge their arrogance. Make them think. And in the process you will allow others to think as well. Remember that in this discussion between Jew Jesus and these Jewish leaders there are other people standing around who are listening to all this. Why do you listen to him? He's got a demon and he's, he's crazy. And the others say, really? This doesn't sound like a man who's crazy. And I've never seen a demon open the eyes of the blind. Have you? Well, what do we take away from this section? First, I want you to notice that there was a plan. The death of and resurrection of Christ, the salvation of the Gentiles, the merger of Jews and Gentiles into one flock, all of that was part of a plan God had from the foundation of the world. He's not reacting knee-jerk. There's a plan. We react to, invent, to events as they unfold. That's not how God acts. He's acting according to a perfect plan. And the second thing I want you to notice has to do with that plan. It includes us. I, I cannot get over verse 16. I just can't. Can't, can't get over John 17 where he, where he talks about praying for those who are going to believe because of their word. That's me. I was in his mind. So were you if you know Christ. 
He already knew you would be part of this flock. You're not a mistake. God made you to be exactly who you are. And he has a plan for you. Third, Jesus submitted to his Father. God the Son submitted to God the Father. That doesn't mean he's a lesser deity, which, as we've already talked about, but it does mean he understood his role in the Godhead and carried it out to perfection. If Jesus Christ, the perfect God the Son, acted in perfect submission to the Father, shouldn't we? Now you say, yeah, but he was perfect. Okay, so um, being perfect, wouldn't it be easy for him to say, I don't, listen, I don't need to listen to you, I'm perfect. And we're not perfect. We make all kinds of mistakes. You know, I haven't counted them up, but I, I'll bet you I'm already past two hands today. We do all kinds of things that are wrong. We do all kinds of things that are sinful. And yet we, we look at God and say, I don't like your plan. I'm going to do things my way. That doesn't make any sense. On its face, it doesn't make any sense. We should be following God, not, not ourselves. We should want to serve our God with everything we've got. And finally, from this passage, we see again that Jesus was our sacrifice. It's the reason we sang all these songs about the cross this morning. He willingly laid down his life for us. And of course, he also powerfully took it back again. That's what, we, that's what we celebrate at, at Resurrection Sunday at Easter, if you want to say that. We celebrate the fact that we serve a risen Savior. And you know, we don't, we don't have to take a back seat to anybody on that discussion. We, we don't have to say to people, well, I know you don't believe that, and it might not be true. We don't have to do that. The evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is overwhelming. Overwhelming. And, and people will say, yeah, but that's all evidence that was written by people that he knew. No, not, no. First of all, it, there was a lot that was written by people that he knew and who loved him. But there was a lot that was written by people who he knew who didn't love him. And there was a lot that came out of people, uh, things that we know, for instance, uh, had there been a body, do you, you don't think that the Jews would have worked really hard to find that body and produce it? They never could. There's a lot of evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as you enter into this season, if you get into discussions with unbelievers who, who denigrate the resurrection, you can tell them from, from, a, from the perspective of written ancient literature, there's not one event in the ancient world that comes anywhere close to being as well verified as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Nothing. It's an amazing event. Jesus was our sacrifice laid his life down, he took it up again. And that perfect sacrifice made it possible for us to be the children of God. Have you trusted Christ? I hear that, Lamb. I hope all of you can say that, but, th but it may be that there's somebody here who can't, who cannot say, I've trusted Christ as my Savior. And if there's somebody here who does not know Jesus Christ as Savior, make today be the day. Become a child of God today. So, well, how do I do that? Put your faith in Jesus Christ. You can't work your way there. You can't earn it. You can't be good enough. But you can trust Jesus to save you from your sin. And that's what the Bible says you need to do. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's, that's how we get saved, by faith. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And he wants to save you. Bow for prayer. Father, he came to save us, but he came to save others as well. And those of us who are here as Christians need to be reminded that um, the message of the gospel is something we're supposed to spread, not hide. We shouldn't leave it under a bushel. It should be out there for everybody to see and hear. They need to know that we're Christians. And then they need to know how they can become one, and they need to hear that from us. So I pray, Father, as we think about this passage and all that Jesus did in his obedience and his power, 
his love and the father's love for him all these things would would grab a hold of our hearts and sink deep into our hearts and help us to recognize the wonder of what we have and to be willing to share that use this passage as you see fit in each one of our hearts in Jesus name Our hymn of response this morning is number uh, 330, Are You Washed in the Blood?